<sighs> All right. I just, I was in and out if I should say this word or not. <clears throat> Decided to do it with care, with caution. <laughs> um, I want to start off with something that happened to me. I've said this to you before, but I'm going to focus on this dream that someone had about me years ago. But I'm going to, many times when I say this dream, I just say it and I continue talking about whatever the message is. But I'm going to focus on what this dream really fully unfolded and keep that to be the topic. The, the, what the dream showed is the topic, okay? So what the dream was this, years ago, maybe around 2005, 2006, that kind of time, uh, could be wrong. I'm not good, great with timing, okay? So you got to understand this about me because you might hear me in a sermon say, oh, about two years before, and then the next time I'll say, about a year and a half before, because I'm just, it's gone in my head. I don't know, I know it was a little while back. But anyway, around that time, um, God was really, I was really taking God serious, okay? God was always taking me serious, but now I was taking him serious. I said, enough with me playing games, okay? It was a big deal that happened, and I'm not going to go into that because I'll take some time. An experience happened. 2000, I became a Christian. By 2000, 2004, close to 2000, end of 2004, like 2005, I was living a double life. I was going to church on Sunday, but then doing stuff I shouldn't be doing during the week, speaking like I shouldn't be speaking, acting like I shouldn't be acting, but then I'm at church, I act just like a Christian. Yay, praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise God. You know, it's have the lingo, the, the language, pretty good. Fooling people, I was, being, I was leading Bible studies, and I'm literally sleeping with women afterwards, you know, doing all this stuff, and, but I'm still, you know, because it was just, yeah. But then in 2005, I had this encounter with the Lord, which caused me to decide, okay, I'm not going to play anymore. God, I'm going to follow you all the way. And uh, when I started following him all the way, everything changed. He then he asked me to quit my job, my business and everything. That's what he told me. I'm not telling you go quit your business or anything, okay? This process started happening. I started hearing him clearer. I started taking steps into things that were scary for me because I wasn't sure what it would look like for me to give up my business, my only income. You know, because I, I wanted to know the answers before I do it, but that's not faith. Faith is to trust God if he tells you to do something, even if you don't know all the answers or the, you know, what will happen next. So I did, I started doing this kind of stuff, but in this time, as I'm being with God stronger, praying for hours, waking up, fasting, just really deep, deep, full on, okay, and everything was about him. I was trying to figure out what's next now. So I'll wake up from four o'clock in the morning, sometimes five o'clock in the morning. I'm praying for hours before I start my day. Um, then I'll go on the street with a backpack, walking around, looking for people to preach the gospel to, give them food, going in Melbourne City. Again, I'm not saying all this to boast or anything. I'm telling you, building up what's happening to me at this time. And as we, me and some friends of mine decided since the Bible said in the book of Acts that they met daily to pray, he said, they met daily. So one friend suggested, hey, why don't we start meeting daily? So I thought, yeah, okay, let's do it. So we started meeting daily according to the time that all us four, it was four of us, were able to. I could do it all day because I just quit everything. But they could only do it after work. So some would come at five, some would come at seven in the, in the night, and then we keep praying until about 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, things like this. Many weird things was happening during this time because of how full on we were going daily, praying like this together in one accord. From getting told from God to go to the city, Melbourne city, and just do crazy stuff, like approach people that we wouldn't usually approach, do things we wouldn't usually do, this boldness was coming at us. We were confronting our fears, taking risks, Crazy stuff. It was beautiful, amazing time like this. Because it, it was just like kids just realized that there's a swimming pool we never jumped in before. And this swimming pool had lots of treasures inside. And we were able to have the adventure of checking all this stuff inside in this ocean of God's adventure. That's what it felt like. It was so fun. We didn't know what he's going to tell us to do next. So a friend of mine comes to me one night at the prayer thing. She goes, Andrew, I, just, I saw a dream of you. And in this dream, 
and this is the bit that you've heard before, some of you. You get up like a little child, as if it's Christmas, and you run to this tree. Uh, as, and and this, under the tree, there's gifts which are treasures that God has given you. Gifts which are treasures, this is what's very important. Gifts which are treasures that God has given you. Uh, and I said, and I said, okay, cool. So I put it on the shelf and I started thinking, okay, what's these gifts which are treasures? Is it prophecy? Is it the gift of healing? And all this kind of stuff, I was trying to figure out what it is. I didn't have immediately God telling me what it is. When God, when I hear someone gives me a, a word like this or a dream, when God wants to tell me immediately, boom, answer. He, t he tells me the translation of that dream. But that didn't happen. And my friend didn't also have any translation what that dream meant. So I was making up stuff in my head and it's okay. I was like, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But I knew it was me trying to figure it out. Then I let it be. Next thing I know, whatever, how long it was, like a couple of days later, a week later, one of the things was, because remember, we're doing this every day. That's why I'm confused to tell you it was the next day could be, it could be two days later, it could be three days later, it could be a week later, but it wasn't far off. The person comes to me again and says, Andrew, again I see the same dream. You get up like a little kid, you run to the tree like it's Christmas, excited in other words, and God put under the tree gifts which are treasures that is given to you. And then she added something. She said, and God... And she said, some were blue, some were small, some were big, all different ribbon colors, all this kind of stuff. Some were red, different colors, different ribbons, different sizes. And he says, and she said, and God's saying, do not try to put them into the order that you think they're exactly how they're meant to be. And I'm like, what? What kind of gift of prophecy is that? What kind of gift of healing? How can this be meaning gift of healing? So I realized, it can't, maybe it's not gift of healing or any of this stuff that we read in the Bible. So I didn't know what it meant. And I was pondering and wondering what it could mean. Nothing was coming. Roughly a few months later, six months or more, it was a while after, I completely forgot about that dream, about what she said. I put it on my spiritual shelf. I have a spiritual shelf. I put things that people tell me, if they got a word, if they feel like God's speaking to them, to me about something, I say thank you, and I put it on the spiritual shelf. I don't let the word become my, oh, but God said this. No, John said that. Chris said that. Diana said that. Rebecca said that. You get me? It doesn't mean God said it. It could be them. So I put it there, and I, if God is, is saying that, he'll make it known and he'll bring it to pass. No problem. I don't have to do that. So I left it on the shelf, and roughly a few months later, I'm going for a walk. I love going for a walk with Jesus. And as I'm walking, immediately, I'm not asking about the dream or nothing. I'm just walking with Jesus. My, I completely forgot about this dream stuff. Boom, flashback hits my mind of the dreams, both of them playing in speed, not a speed of light, something, something faster than the speed of light. Do you know what the speed of light, uh, faster than the speed of light is? What's faster than the speed of light? Speed of thought. So in full-on speed, I see the, the dreams play back. So I see her coming in, telling me, hey, Andrew, I saw a dream, and, da, 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 and she's literally replaying and saying the same stuff. Then the answer immediately. And the gifts which are treasures were people that God was going to give me. He's going to put, in other words, he's going to put people in my life which to him are treasures. They are gifts to me and to the world. And the reason why they were all different colors and different ribbons and different sizes, and I'm not meant to try to move them around, was because you are unique. And you're not meant to be put the small with the small, the red with the red, the blue with the blue, the green with the green. And so basically what God was trying to say to me as well was, do not try to make them in your own image, in your own likeness. Do you understand what I just said there? Don't try to make them a lot of little Andrew, talking like Andrew, acting like Andrew, praying like Andrew would pray. You understand? So he wanted to make sure to emphasize this reality. And that played in my head because what you didn't know is I was under a church at one stage where it was very controlling, very legalistic, very 
militant. And I thank God for my time that I had there. But it, it got to the point with this ministry, this type of pastors, it's not just one, it's this, it's a type of people. It's like a, it's like a group, a spiritual group that there's many of them around the world. You can always see it exactly the way they respond. They might wear different clothes, different, there might be a different color of their skin, but it's the same spirit that's over them. And you can, you can, uh, me, I can enter into a church now and I can literally smell it. I'm like, he, this is, he's got that. This pastor's got this on them. So this, this pastor that I was under was very militant, very, um, like I said, I love the discipline I learned from that guy. But he got to a place that all of us as a church, we it, basically, it felt like we needed to ask permission for everything we did. Without realizing, I don't even know, I don't even believe that he was doing this on purpose or anything. He just, how he was, and the influence of what's influencing him was influencing the rest of us because we were submitting unto his headship. So it comes over you, whatever's the head, right? Of course, Jesus is the head, but I'm talking about then is the, the pastor is leading us, right? So he became so controlling that we, there was people that were coming up to him and to these kind of pastors that will ask, uh, Am I allowed to get married this year? Should I get married next year? What do you think, Pastor? Do you know, is it, should I go to school yet? Or should I stay away from going to school, to university? What do you think, Pastor? And they're not asking him out of counsel. Please hear me. It's okay to ask your pastor or any brother or sister that you know loves God and prays and will hear God for you as well and kind of like see what they think. But very different to what I'm talking about. It's where they feel like they have no choice and I must ask my, my, my boss, am I allowed to go pee? Can I go to the toilet and have a shower now? Can I go, pastor? Can I go? It gets that full on. Of course, not about going to pee or, you know, go have a shower, but that's how controlling it gets. And there was a movement called the Shepherd's Movement at one stage because revivals were breaking out. And I don't know if it was Everyone called it the Shepherd's Movement, but this Shepherd's Movement came where they started trying to, trying to uh, fix the problem of how free people were be being. It was overboard, yes, everyone was doing crazy things and I uh, got touched by God, so everything, everyone was doing anything. So then the Shepherd's Movement came in where they were trying to put things back in order. And it went so far that what happened was they became controlling, not putting things back in order, they became completely controlling. And that's when they started forming people in their image, in their likeness. And if anyone even speaks against or questions the pastor, you're in sin. If anyone thinks that maybe that pastor was maybe wrong, oh, oh mate. It, it got to an unhealthy place, okay? That's what I'm saying. I have to be careful what I'm saying. Because there's the real, you know, there's the... What I want you to do is, I'm going to try to explain it as best as I can, but in no way am I saying, put everything in one basket and throw it out, okay? Because I'm speaking about an area, it doesn't mean now that you hear something that looks a little bit like that, you immediately judge that person and put them in that basket and say, aha, he's like that. No, he might not be, okay? So you learn to pray and hear from God what to do. But let's, let's, let's continue. So... I was under this other, another pastor that he was also trying to control me at one stage and make me like his image, his likeness. Loving person, I love him. To this day, I love him, no matter what. And he was, I didn't even realize he was trying to control me and, and, and mold me into his image, his likeness, that God, do you know how I found out? He confessed to me and apologized to me for what he was doing. He wanted me to sit down to him to tell me something and God showed him a dream to correct him for what he's about to do, what he was doing to me. And he said, Andrew, I'm sorry. I've been trying to push you to become like me and mold you to become like me. And God said to me last night in a dream, stop taming my lion. Taming means calm down my lion because he's a very calm man. He's like, oh, everything has to be like this. And I'm not. I'm like, Duh -duh -duh, you know, like, <laughs> I was just different. I'm built different by God. But he wanted me to be 
calm down just like he is. I've had pastors rebuke me, correct me, take me on the side and say to me, listen, Andrew, I was just like you when I was younger. You remind me of me, but you'll get there. Do you know what they mean? One day you'll become like they are, like he was. And I was thinking, God forbid. And all honesty, again, from the mentality that they had, I was like, no. Another pastor told me one time, you're just like this because you're immature, because I was fired up. All right? Still am. And you'll change. You'll calm down and you'll become mature. Well, it's been 20 years. Not much has changed. <laughs> Praise God. Because if maturity again looked like what that pastor was telling me maturity looks like, like he looked like, hey, praise God that that's what you think maturity looks like, but stick that version to yourself. Don't push that on me, mold me into your image and your likeness of what you think maturity looks like. Because John the Baptist was pretty mature. Probably stank, 100% never wore a suit. He wore camel's hair and ate locust and honey. And I'm just saying that was John the Baptist, and that's okay. So you be you. Let that John the Baptist be John the Baptist. Let that person be that person, but be who you are in Christ. That's who we are. In His likeness, in His image, let that flow out of us more than anything instead of trying to make people in our image our likeness. Let me continue. Are you okay? Okay, it's going to be a bit of a sobering one today. I'm going to read some things I wrote to keep me. I'm going to speak about today through this dream that I, also, I began with. Controlling uh, legalistic religious um, pastors and churches and those who come from them. Two different things there. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, okay, as we go. Controlling pastors and Christians wanting to make you in their image and likeness. These people don't realize they are walking in bondage and not in the freedom Jesus paid for them to have. So because they are in bondage, they respond by trying to bind people into their own limits. They fault finding. They find faults with everybody. They put religious boundaries on themselves and on you. Boundaries that don't have, are not in the Bible. It's just that's what happened to them. I was one of those religious people. I was one of those controlling legalistic people. That's how I know this. I tasted it. I became one. Because I was under that second pastor that I told you about, the first one. Actually, I spoke to you about him first. So it influenced how I was being. Not blaming him. I chose to be like that. Exactly. It is a spirit. So when I came here, so God set me free from this bondage. And he was still sending me free. And when I came, ah, when I've been to some churches, I started seeing the bondage. Because remember, in Australia, you know, I fly over to different countries and preach there as well, including here. In Australia, in my church, I'm okay with people wearing shorts, wear your flip-flops. It's okay. Don't wear immodest clothing. Don't come with your samples of your breasts. Cover them, because unless you're selling them. If you're selling them, okay, show a bit of them. And uh, tell us what price it is. So cover them because you're modest, you're a queen. Same with men. Have modesty. Okay? Absolutely. But where we start pushing people where it's not even in the Bible anything about it, that's where it gets a bit weird. I used to believe that women shouldn't color their hair. I believed that it was sinful and wrong in God. I was wrong. It was my bound bondage legalistic religious mindset that came upon me and so I was judging my sisters in the Lord and brothers in Australia in my heart I was judging them doesn't matter if I didn't tell you I was doesn't matter if I looked lovely to you I was judging them immediately thinking what a sinful they don't even hear God because they're dying their hair wow and there's not one scripture against dying your hair but yet, for some reason, I believed it was wrong. And I would put that on you. If you were around me, I will make you feel bad 
that you have dyed hair. Do you know what happened to me more? At one stage, I thought if a girl puts makeup on, she's in sin. See how bad it got? It got to a place where I couldn't find this stuff in the Bible. But yet, I was convinced that it was so wrong. You can imagine what I thought of a woman that has short hair. Because in the Bible, Paul spoke a scripture, but I was so messed up, I didn't learn it from God. I learned it from reading half out of context scripture and started judging my sisters. Imagine the, the patience God had with me that I was being like this. Then I, I became free. God started setting me free because I left that church. When I left that church, it was like, like I left a prison that I didn't know I was in. And I could see the prison now. I went, oh, and it was like I could breathe. Because oh, as long as I was in that prison of this church, it doesn't matter if sincere, love them. But the reality was, I was in a prison and the mindset of what was fed in that prison was engulfing me too. So I was judging my brothers and sisters all over the place, not showing love, nor praying for them. So when I came here and other churches and other countries, I mean, because I wasn't just involved in my own little box, my own, in other words, in my own little church building, but now I was going to other people's churches to preach and to do all this kind of stuff. People will come up to me <laughs> after I finish preaching and they will say things like this to me. Uh, you know, you shouldn't wear shorts in church. And I'm like, did you even hear any of the sermon? Like, did you like the sermon? Were you blessed and encouraged for Jesus and love Jesus more? You know, did you get any word or were you just looking at my shorts? So consumed with accusation and fault finding that you deafen your ears from hearing what the Lord would say. There's the same spirit that would have rejected John the Baptist and his message. Why? Because he's wearing the wrong clothes. He's wearing camel hair. And God made sure of it. Don't you think that God was in this? Making sure that he breaks every religious mindset. Gets this guy that's going to wear camel hair. With no tie. Just camel hair. Preaching and he had the message from God. That people will risk their lives to go into the wilderness. Where there was bandits that could stab you to rob you. Rape you. And they would risk themselves to travel, to walk and find him to hear his message. And what was his message? His message wasn't, Jesus loves you. Repent, every one of you. That's what he was screaming. It was not a, a lovely message. It was not an ear tickling message. They were coming to him saying, what shall we do? Stop doing what you've been doing. Stop taking more money that you have. Repent for that. Give back to what you've taken. He's like, bam, 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 bam. And then he gets a little bit hungry, gets a bit of locust. A little bit of katsarira. I don't think he was a great guy to be around. Honestly, I don't think he was like a pastor. Like, oh, poor guy, you know, come here. I don't think so. I'm just guessing just the way he sounds in the scriptures. Yet God chose that man. He sent him out. Dressed gangster. <laughs> yeah. But I was, I was realizing, see, because I tasted of the bondage, because I was part of the being bound, I was able to see it now. So the people, I was getting people saying, hey, Andrew, you're wearing shorts. You shouldn't wear shorts in church. It's not right. What you're doing right now, you see how you're crossing your legs? And you too? You would have been told off. In some of these churches, they were saying you shouldn't cross your legs in church. I was like, what? Yeah, it still exists. Yeah, I know. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. All this stuff still exists. We're talking about a month ago. This is, this is still happening. But we've got to help our brothers and sisters become free. Not put them down. Not get them. It's not a competition that we're better. It's, I, I feel sorry for them because I felt what it felt like to be bound thinking I'm free. Bound, oppressed, thinking I am higher, above, more. Wow, look how Christian I am. But I was literally lost in my head, in my heart from God. I had another person say to me, Andrew, you should not wear flip-flops. 
while you're preaching. That's like my dress code, man. Flip flops, man. You, you know, you feel it. You feel it. I shouldn't wear flip flops. So I, I really, and many times I was like, thank you. Okay, thank, praise God. And if I was at their church, I would come the next time with no flip flops. There's no, no need to argue with them. It says in the Bible, if, if your brother's faith is weak and he thinks you shouldn't eat meat, don't eat it for him. Don't fight it. Now, if they came here and they told me, Andrew, you shouldn't wear shorts and flip flops, I'd be like, Dory's there. <laughs> God bless you. If you want to hear the message, or you want to you know, hear Jesus in this and love God and grow and love each other, no problem. But if you want to come to turn me into your image, your likeness, what you think I should be and not be, then I don't want to hurt you, please. The door is there. I don't want to make a stumbling block to you. So you learn when to bend the knee to that or not. Jesus made sure that on the Sabbath day, he allowed his disciples to pluck corn, knowing that's going to offend the Jews. Because you're not meant to pick food on the Sabbath. He was allowed, he knew exactly what they were doing and he allowed it. And literally, I'm telling you, because he knows. These religious guys come up to him going, why are you allowing your disciples to do what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? And Jesus' answer was uh, bringing up a scripture from the Old Testament of another guy that broke the law to do what was not lawful to do. <laughs> About David, how he went in the temple and he shouldn't have, and they ate the bread because they were hungry. <clears throat> another person came up to me saying to me, Andrew, you wear black a lot. Like, oh, you're jealous, I'll give you my t-shirt. You want some black clothes? I don't know, I didn't buy them all. Here. Yeah, the gangsterness. Listen to, how sad is this? How sad our brothers and sisters are so bound that wearing black, because it's not from God to wear black, oh, well, then he shouldn't have created that color. I don't care if you're going to get all thingy about it. White and black is not a color. Well, to me it is. It doesn't matter. The point is, it exists. Who made it exist? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing's wrong with wearing colors. God is very colorful, including black. Let me give you an example of scripture where religious people did this to Jesus. Ready? Remember, we have no idea what happened to Jesus. It's not written. We have no historical document from the Bible or anything else to show what happened. He went missing in being spoken about between 12, I think it was, until 30. There's no history. He just disappears. He speaks one story about him, you know, where he disappeared from his mom, Mary, and he goes with the priest and he starts talking to them and they found him because they lost him. And that's it. We never hear another thing about him when he's young until he's 30 and he comes back in the picture. Well, what we believe is, it, it, well, it's, not a, it's a, most likely 99.9% .9 of fact. There is no way in, a, in Israel anyone would be, walk, just you walking around, you would be called a rabbi. Just because you're walking around and you know some scriptures. A rabbi went to rabbi school to be called a rabbi. So through those years, he must have went to rabbi school. That's why he was even allowed to speak in the church, in the synagogue. And that's when he read Isaiah and other scrolls, because that's what his custom was to do. They allowed him because he's a rabbi. That's why I said rabbi. So the religious people, because he started acting a little bit different. See, Jesus didn't wear flip-flops. He wore sandals. He's more like you. Praise the Lord. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> In fact, one time I preached about this. I said, there's people that are telling me don't wear flip-flops. And then I threw my shoes out like this, lift them out. And I said, no feet at all, no, I mean, no shoes at all is more biblical. Because God says to him, take your shoe sandals off. This is holy ground. God tells Moses, take off your sandals. This is holy ground. So God wants barefoot. Sorry, guys, from next week, please come to church with bare feet. That's what we do here. If we're going to really keep it scriptural, then that's what we should be doing, right? 
John chapter 8, verse 2 to 11, watch how this happens to Jesus. Now early in the morning, Jesus came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees, these are the religious people, the scribes that write down the things of the, of the Lord, and the Pharisees, bought, which was a religious sect, a religious sect that believed in God, taught, were trained up to be Pharisees. It was very serious training to become a Pharisee, okay? In other words, a priest or a, or a you know, part of that system. Okay, then verse 3, then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman and caught in adultery. Who brought the, the woman? The priests, the religious people, the believers brought this a woman caught in adultery. They actually caught her in the act. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. In other words, they literally saw her and caught her doing it. Where did the guy go? Why didn't they get the man as well? Ooh, anyway. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. That's what a religious spirit does. This spirit, if you're functioning in it, okay, and you watching, if to know one of the fruits of how you know that you actually have this ruling you a little bit, maybe a lot, it accuses. It looks to find fault and accuse. No matter what it is. Doesn't matter if there's no scripture for it, whatever. Even if you want to twist scripture to hit him with, just like Satan did, he'll do that. So they, they, they threw this woman to his feet and saying, the, now the most uh, teacher, well, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law, in other words, in the Bible, that was their Bible. Uh, Moses commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him that they might have something which to accuse him. But Jesus stopped, stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. Now, some of us believe, because he never says what he wrote down, some of us believe he was writing down their sins. So when they continued asking him, because that's what religious, controlling, legalistic people under this spirit do. They keep pressuring. They need you to do, hey, why do you do this? They don't accuse you, put you down, tell you, hey, you have to be more like this, you have to be more like that, you have to be our image and likeness that we think people of God should be like. He raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. How beautiful is he, Jesus? So he's writing something on the ground. Don't have a clue what it is. Just theories. He gets back up and says, Who of you have never sinned before? You throw your first stone. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Again, we don't know what he's writing. Probably continuing writing stuff about Yanagi, Chris, Johnny, all the guys that were there. And they're looking at it going, oh, How does he know that? How does he know I'm a liar? Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I've, be I've been in trouble. And again, I'm not saying this defending or that I'm broken or hurt about it. I'm saying this so you can have this in your soul, this memory of what I'm about to say. So when it's happening to you, don't, get, don't take it personal. Don't get offended. Pray for them knowing that the love of God hasn't been perfected in their hearts. There's a spirit ruling our brothers and sisters, using them to accuse, condemn, bring division, look for the worst, find faults, want to push you to become their image, their likeness. So when they're pushing you, just go, thank you, okay, I hear you, take care, and then pray for them when you walk away. Don't, you know, I can't believe what they said. Don't get like that. I've had people
that got angry at me because I didn't react the way they wanted me to react in the sin the other person did. So I'll give you an example. Someone did something wrong in, from the church, okay, in a church that I was leading. And they came to tell me about it. And I spoke to them, I, I listened to God for them. I heard that they're broken about what they did. And what I thought from God at times, other times I don't feel it like this. I feel like responding differently. But what I've seen them get angry at me, others get angry at me, is that I heard what the person did and said. They were sorry and they wanted to change. They were broken for what they did. So I didn't need to slap them more. I didn't need to go, you, I can't believe what you did. You know how angry God is. I didn't need to say anything. I didn't have to convince them that what they did was wrong. They already admit that. They're already beating themselves up enough with the devil on top of them too, beating them up for what they did. They didn't need me to help them. What I felt was from God was to do this to them. Hey, you're breathing. God allowed you to live today. When did you do that? Two days ago. Are you breathing? God allowed you to live for two days up to now. That means he showed you twice his mercy. You woke up because he allowed you to wake up. Are you going to receive his mercy? Come on. Are you repentant? Are you sorry for what you did? Are you going to go and apologize? Yes. Uh, okay, come on. Let's go. When others heard how I responded to this person, that's not right. As a pastor, you should have done it like this and like this, and you should have told them off, and you should have... No. Sorry. You see, they wanted me to respond a specific way. And because my response was different to the way they were expecting, they wanted me to respond. Just like the Pharisees wanted Jesus to respond a specific way according to the scriptures of Moses. But Jesus didn't use those scriptures at this time because he, he considered the heart, he considered what's happened, he considered the motive, everything. And so he decided to show mercy instead. He, he decided to go with another scripture by what God wanted at that moment for that person which was the woman caught in adultery for that case. So because I also at times didn't want to approach the situation with a specific scripture in the Bible, but a different one instead, because that's what I felt from God, that wasn't good enough for these religious controlling people. They want you to respond in the way they believe you should. And if you don't, you're not a good leader. You're responding wrong and you should have done it this way and that way. And this is the kind of heart that comes out from them and the pressure for you to be like their image, their likeness. But you just be faithful to God and what you're sensing in your heart, what you're discerning to do at that moment, and let God be the judge at the end, if you did it wrong or right. In other words, don't give in to the fear of man and the pressure of man, but give in to what you believe is what God wants for that situation and each situation you come across. Do you understand what happens with these kind of people? They, the way they treat themselves many times, so harshly, they want me to treat them, to the, treat the others like that because that's what they would have said to them if they had the opportunity. They would have dealt with them so harshly instead of stepping back because it's not always you take one scripture in the Bible and say, ah, oh, whenever anyone, someone does that, you rebuke your brother, you correct him. Maybe it's not always that. Maybe it's speaking to them who they can be in the Lord instead because they've already seen what they've stuffed up in. They've already acknowledged and they say it themselves more than anybody else. I'm a failure. Look what I've done. You don't need to hear anything else how much you failed. They know. Maybe they need someone to believe that they can be who God created them to be. And they look at you going, you really believe that? Yeah, but look what I've done. I know. Come on, let's get up together. Stop thinking that tomorrow will be like yesterday. And even if you fail, get back up again. If God is giving you mercy, who am I not to? Did you hear that? If God has given you another day to live when he could have dropped you dead, if he was that sick of you, he could drop you dead and me. But if he didn't decide to drop you dead, who am I to kill you in my heart? Who am I to disown you in my heart? Who am I to speak death instead of life, cursings instead of blessings? Now, if that person came to me speaking to me unrepentantly. I don't care what I did to that person. Why should I? 
the, you know, Jesus forgives and, and talks like this and starts using the Bible as well, like it's okay and all that kind of stuff, I would say, hey, well, what are you talking about, man? You better repent for this hardness of heart that you have, this arrogance. I would talk to them like that. Unless God shows me not to. I choose with the Lord. I, I, I spend some time with Him. And many times when I don't have the opportunity because it just came at me, I'm just sensitive to Him. God, what do you want me to do? This is your son, not mine. This is your daughter, not mine. How do you want me to speak to your daughter? And I'm sure I failed and made mistakes, by the way. When I should have been more harsh, but I was actually more gentle. And I should have been more gentle, but I was a bit more harsh. And you will too. But have the heart willing to be molded by God and don't think everyone you treat them the same way when they did the same sin you don't know how you're meant to respond you always ask God how you should respond but I've been in trouble from brothers and sisters literally walking out of the church not wanting to come back because I wasn't harsh enough because I didn't treat someone like they wanted me to treat them no I'm not and you got to remember that that you don't need to bend and become like their image their likeness you become like His image, His likeness. Find out what God wants you to do. In fact, I read a book one time and I fell in love with this section in the book. It showed about this army of God. And this army of God was the last day army. It was the army that was marching in every city they were marching in. They were smooth. I'm talking about they will pass dry ground and when they passed over it, the ground started springing up, green trees, plants, the grass was becoming green. Life was coming upon this place because the people of God were marching, the true army of God, the end day army. And then he says that he's, he's, God allowed him to zoom in to see more closely this army. And he noticed this, he said, even though when they were camping, not marching, okay, camping, he said, you couldn't understand who the generals were, who the commanders were, who the soldiers were. You couldn't understand whose rank was what. Why? Because they all acted like family. They would joke with each other, generals with the soldiers and all this kind of stuff. The generals didn't sit on a higher chair going, I'm a general. You're a soldier. Like some places are like that because they're pastor. You have to, oh. Please don't throw everything in the bucket right now. You honor the rank. You honor the position. You honor that these priests were given themselves to the things of God. But don't treat them as if they're loved more by God. Or you are not a son. Or you are not worthy to be royalty like they are. You are royalty, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, kings. What would one king, how would one king treat another king if they were going to meet two presidents from two different nations? How would they meet? They will usually go, they show honor with each other, shake hands, sit to the same level, all this kind of stuff. Well, we're all kings, all priests. Do you know what will happen? When the order for war came, it said in this book, so they would sit, hanging out with each other, joking, loving one another. Immediately when the order for war came, the generals would stand up and everyone knew their position and honored the rank immediately. They wouldn't come up, uh, come here, Pride, for me. Come here for a second. They wouldn't, the, the, the uh, soldier wouldn't touch the pastor and go like this, hey, buddy, because <laughs> he's not the same age. He's not the same ranking. You understand? But they are friends. You understand? Thank you, bro. Good acting. I'm going to start doing a movie career. So I'm not saying dishonor, disrespect them either. But what I loved about what I was reading was when the generals rose up and said to their command, saying, come on, we have to march forward now. You guys do this, you guys do that, you guys do that. Everyone go, yes, sir, boom. And they went, boom. And dispersed into do the war, to do what they were called to do. And everyone knew their position and no one envied each other's position or were jealous of one another. They loved who each one of them was in the Lord. They love what Jesus did in you and in you and in you. And that's where my heart's always been now. Since I read that, I said, God, do that in me. Let me see people. And do you know what people do to me? People get angry at me that I don't elevate myself as higher than them. They want me to control them. Remember how I said I'm going to speak about controlling churches, but also those who come from them. 
Some people have come from a church that they were controlled. And there's so much weeds inside and tangled with them still that when they come to churches like this, they're like, oh, you know, I don't know, Andrew should be more like this. And why isn't he wearing a suit? He should be wearing a suit and a tie. Why is he, why doesn't he come up and look elevated more than me? And, you know, I, I have to bow down and do this. Hey, pastor, because I want to wash your feet instead. If I want to be the greatest, I'll be the servant of all. Sorry that I'm not controlling enough for you. They honestly, they get angry. This is one of the biggest ones people get angry at me about that I'm not controlling at them. That when they try to go, hey, hey, just call me Andrew, man. No, 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 I want to call you. Okay, all right, call me whatever you want. And again, I'm not saying don't show honor and respect and love. Do it out of that, not because you think that I'm loved more than you, than you by God or. Something else. I am carrying a rank from the Lord. I'm carrying a position given to me by God. And I want to honor that. But that doesn't mean you're worth less than me. I, I'm, I have to be careful what to say because it's real stories and they're getting filmed. So I don't want that person or any person to get offended or hurt when I don't need to. Sometimes I don't care in a good way because God doesn't care about me saying the truth even if it's going to offend someone. But sometimes it's okay not to say it. So I'm not going to say it this time, the next bit. One of the characteristics, again, of legalistic, religious, and the religious is to find faults, to accuse, controlling, uh, and want to be controlled. Did you hear that? They're just, just controlling. They want to be controlled. In fact, where the shepherd's movement happened, where it was so engraved, it went to so many nations in the world. I saw it here in Cyprus, in Africa, you see it like crazy. In Africa, some of the pastors are worship men. They walk around, oh, the pastor, oh, the pastor. And the pastors like it. it they, they, it's like they get drunk from it. Yeah. <laughs> it's so sad. It's so wrong. I was in Africa and I rebuked the pastors there. I don't know if I say, yeah, it was probably a rebuke. A cor correct sounds nicer, but I think it was a rebuke. Because I was seeing so much idolatry lifting up the pastors and the pastors loved it. They were like, I am the, it's like a famous actor was coming into town, but he was the pastor. Usually called prophet this guy, prophet that guy, prophet that, apostle this, prophet this, prophet that. And at one stage, they made a stage for us because we we're doing a three-day crusade in Ghana. And they made a stage, they built it from scratch. It's amazing talent. Boom, 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 they put it up. And then they put these chairs that were dressed nicely for the pastors and the prophets to sit on the stage. And I hated it. I wanted to come and I told them that I want to go downstairs to preach. I don't want to be on the stage. That's why you mostly see wherever we do sermons, we have a stage over there. Where do I preach from? I put the pulpit on the bottom. I'm not saying don't. Sometimes the church is too big and you have to see all the heads, so you have to be. So I'm not saying everyone that's up on a stage is, stop judging them now. <laughs> I'm just saying that was my heart. And I started seeing so much idolatry onto the pastor that when I first came to Ghana and I started walking around through this refugee camp of thousands, the, the woman prophetess, she called herself, I'm not, maybe she is, I don't know. I've never heard her prophesy, so I don't know. I just met the woman. She wanted to be on the poster. I was against the poster. But the man that was bringing, well, telling us, come, we paid our own way to get there. He said, no, no, it has to be on a poster. That's how it's done here. And I'm like, <sighs> so they didn't even like my picture because there was, I wasn't wearing a suit with a tie because I was wearing a T-shirt behind the white wall. And the, one of the uh, angry things, or okay, one of the things that they kept on emailing us back saying, why can we also put the faces of the women's prophets ministry there as well? I said, who cares who's on the, because they don't want to support who you're coming if their faces are not on there. I'm thinking, what is wrong with everybody? Why do you need to be on a poster? Who cares? 
But I went there and I saw why. And I walk into this, you know, we call it, anyway, it's a building, normal, there's no pavement on the ground, it's just normal dust. They used it to have a church, and I start speaking, and I'm wearing a t-shirt. It was literally a bright yellow t-shirt. And the shorts and my flip-flops. I didn't know that's against the rules. And I'm preaching, and I'm preaching, and I'm preaching, and you know, whatever. At the end, the woman leader gets up. She goes, oh, the Lord. I probably have it on tape somewhere. I still haven't edited and footage because it's sometimes they're holding the camera, filming everything for too long. I still haven't edited many videos that I have of what happened in Ghana. Amazing dancing, by the way, in the churches. We have to repent for not enough dancing like You know, it's awesome. She literally, I'm sitting there because they gave me the honorable chair, but I look like a, a bum to them from the streets. And she's preaching. She, she sorry, gets up on the mic and she starts saying, Oh, the Lord has convicted me. I am so wrong. Because when this man, this man of God came in here, do you know what she was doing? Come sit here for me. Because I can't go too far. Be careful of the wire. I'm sitting there, but remember, everyone else is here because I got the honor seat. I'm so okay to honor people. She was walking up and going, God has convicted me, everyone. Oh, I'm so wrong. He goes, look, because look at this. Look, look at this t-shirt. Look, flip-flops, look at it. Right in front of everybody. I'm like, what's wrong with my t-shirt and my flip-flops? What the, what the? Yeah, she was jealous of my flip-flops. She wanted my yellow shirt. She was confessing that she judged me from a t-shirt and my flip-flops. That she discredited me to be a man of God. She literally said this because of my t-shirt and my flip-flops. See how bad this spirit is? It's just sad. No, it is okay to trust someone's counsel and go to them for advice. In fact, in the Bible, in Proverbs, he says it a few times, in the counsel of many, there is safety. In the counsel of many, there is safety. It is good to go to people and say, hey, not to everybody, just a few people that you know love God. They're not going to tell you what you want to hear, but they're going to ask the Lord for you and pray for you as well, and just you can get their advice. It's okay. It's biblical. Especially as you're learning in the Lord, say, hey, I've been hearing this, or I've been feeling this. Is that right? Do you think it's from God? And you're just hearing advice. Not being controlled, you're just keeping yourself safe because you're still learning, okay? But again, not to go then because you think if you don't, you've done something wrong because they need to tell you that it's okay or not. Even if you're 50 years in the Lord, I would still ask advice, especially if I'm, I'm very involved in the situation, okay? Like in other words, it's personal. Like if you're going to be marrying someone, like someone came into your life, it's okay to go to a brother and say, hey, can you just pray with me, man? Because I'm not sure if she's the one or he's the one. It's okay. Because they're praying as well, backing up, because you're so emotionally attached, you might not be hearing from God clearly because you're emotionally attached to it. But they're not. So it's safe for you. Okay? So that's what I would say. That's what I mean. Let me continue so we can finish. Um, in fact, what happens with this move of, of churches that has happened is everywhere, by the way. Like I said, I've seen it everywhere still see it, where the pastors are controlling, um, they basically end up acting out as the Holy Spirit instead of the Holy Spirit being the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. The Holy Spirit will do everything. He will teach you all things. He's the one who should be, the pastors, I should be encouraging you to get to know the Holy Spirit, to get to know Jesus, to get to know the Father, to know that you can have him as your shepherd. Jesus is your shepherd. He's alive. He's not dead. And I should be saying to you, hey, get to know him. Man, his sheep hear his voice. Not just to your pastor. His sheep hear his voice. You're just a special. And he will speak to you. So I shouldn't be limiting you thinking that I'm more. In fact, what happens is when, when, when the pastor starts functioning in the spirit, they love being needed in this way and having this kind of stature over the people. It's addictive. The shepherd's movement made, made people feel like they are too inadequate or not worthy enough to approach God or hear him for themselves. 
This is what the Orthodox Church still, and the Catholic Church, again, just saying truth, till this day is like. I've sat with Orthodox priests, and they will say to me over and over, and monks, say to me over and over, who do you think you are to understand the Scriptures? Because I'm not an Orthodox priest. So how can I understand the Scriptures? Because Jesus said we can. Yeah. Why? Because it needs, it's a movement where it has to be built up. You need them. Kiss my hand. You need me. To tell you everything, what you should do and do. That's where the movement comes from. It's the same spiritual thing. Instead of me telling you, yeah, it's your Lord too. Go to Him. Go straight to Him. Let's go together. So they'll say things like, who do you, who do you think you are to understand the Bible? Who are you to baptize someone or do communion? Or pray over someone or for someone and be heard. You, it makes you feel like you can't. You're not adequate enough. You're not a priest. You're not a monk. No, you're a Christian, a son and daughter of God who is reading the word, walking a lifestyle, wanting to please the Lord, repentance. If you fail, you get back up and you do this and you keep going. Just like Paul did, Peter did, all the apostles. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 to 14. And one of the crowd said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So these people come to Jesus, and this guy, one from the crowd said, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus said unto him, Man, who made me judge or a divider over you? See how he shepherded? What are you talking about? I'm not going to make this stuff for you. <laughs> You're dealing with it with yourself. But the shepherd's movement did what? What it would it do? Yes, you should divide this and you should do that. You should take 40%. They'll get real specific detail and control the whole situation. Because the pastor has to say it. Even Jesus said, what are you talking about? Who made me judge or divide over you for these situations? You guys deal with that stuff. Um, a God kind of shepherd will want to treat you with the worth Jesus has for you, the honor you hold because of Jesus, as royalty, as a son, as a daughter of God, that you are a king, priest before God. No matter what your rank is as a position, like I said a couple of weeks ago. A, 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 shep, a shepherd that the Lord, a pastor that the Lord will, I'll say it differently, all the leaders that God will appoint in ranks have this kind of heart that will lead you to the Lord, lead you, teach you how to listen from Him, be led by Him, love you, not try to hold anything back so you always need them, but they want to give you everything they know so you can run the race and do even greater things that I have done. Greater things, you know Him greater than I've ever known because I wouldn't hold anything back of what I've understood and learned. That's how it should be. The, pre, the pastors and stuff have to learn that we, you are not mine, you are his. I've had pastors that have this spirit on them tell me, Andrew, if any of my people come to your church, you tell them to leave and come back to mine. And I'm like, what? Like, what are you talking about? What are they, your dogs? Shoo, 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 go back. What are you talking about? They're people, if they don't want to hear you anymore for a while, if they want to... Okay, they got what they got from you now. They want to, they feel from the Lord or whatever to go to another church. Praise God that they're going to another Christian church. They're not going to a synagogue or a Jehovah's Witness hall or a Muslim thing. Praise God, they're going to one brother, to another pastor. Praise God, where all the churches in heaven is not going to be that person's church there and the, that church there and that church in that corner. It's as His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're a family. So praise God that they just came to you and some of mine went to you. Why? Maybe I shout too much. And they're sick of getting deafened ears before they leave every Sunday. So they decided to go to a calm pastor for a few months or maybe forever because he speaks more gentle and delicate. And praise God, and it's still on fire. It's still good. Cool. Go for it. You know, <laughs> yeah. I would have pastors come as visitors and tell them, literally from Limassol, and say to them, listen, tell them your church details. What time does it start? Guys, if you want to go to their church, go for it. I would start off introduction like that. Because I don't care. I'm not insecure. They're not mine. 
We're here to equip you, these leaders, no matter from what church they are, we are a piece of the puzzle. God has given us some things to pour out to help you run your race. Cheer you on. What am I holding on to? I'm not holding on to you. Go fly. I'm going to bless you and help you go fly to whatever your calling is, whatever God tells you to do next, not to make you feel guilty if you're going to leave. You might can't leave here. You must die in this church. Your mother's mother was going to this church. Your grandmother was in this church. I know. That's why everyone's dying. No, I'm kidding. All right. It's weird. Be free. I will finish with this. See, I'm actually finishing. Praise the Lord. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 to 29. Verse, what? Ah, yes. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. I'm going to move to chapter 5 too, okay? So I'm going to do all to the end. So Galatians chapter 4, 21 to 31. I was really thinking if I should say this, but uh, I'll, I'll just do it, okay? <laughs> Stone me later. Some of you. Okay. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Okay, this, a church to the Galatian church, these were to Christians. And there was trouble. Why? Because some of them still wanted to put bondage on people. And because they were still bound in how they thought things should be done, they were pushing that on the other Christians in that church. You have to be like this also, remember? Christians come from legalistic churches, come into other churches and try to make this church like their image, their likeness. Pressure. They'll pressure me as a pastor. I'm doing, uh, you, you're not doing it right. Your leadership is not good. I'm not happy with your leadership. All right, go create your own. You know? <laughs> tell me who you desire, uh, tell me you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham, listen to this carefully, had two sons. Whose sons were they? Abraham's. Both of them. Listen to the context. Please, get this, okay? It's not a popular scripture. That's why. It's not been told a lot. Abraham had two sons. The one by the bondwoman, the woman that was bound. Remember the context was talking about Christians being under the law still being religious still, in areas where they're not meant to be bound by the law, okay? So he says, uh, the one, the one son that was Abraham's came from the bond woman, the woman that was in bondage, and the other by the free woman. But he who was the, of the bond woman, the slave woman, was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through the promise which things are symbolic. This is a symbol. For these are the two covenants. The one of Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. It's two types of Christianity, two types of believers. One still lives in the flesh, in the law. In other words, wants to put bondage. You need to be like this, stop wearing flip-flops. You got to do that. It has to be more like this. And they want to push it on you. And the other one is from the free woman. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Okay? We're our mother, our mother is the free of the free woman. We're born of the free woman. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children. The one that couldn't have children has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we brothers, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Did you hear this? Are you catching this? He's saying, he's talking about two type of believers. And then he's saying, even back then, when the one that was born from the slave woman was actually attacking Isaac, who was born from the free woman, that's how it is now. In other words, the believers that are still living in the flesh and under the bondage of this, you've got to be like this, and you've got to be like that, and you've got to do that, will attack the believers that are walking in freedom. 
He's saying this to the church. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? I'm not saying we do this, but anyway. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not bear heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brothers, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Christ has set us free. 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 It's a massive thing that he wanted us to understand. We are free. Free. Satan wants us bound. Jesus set us free. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. Whoever the Son of Man set free is free indeed. He's, and in fact, we're so free that in other letters in the Bible, they say, look, don't use your freedom to cause others to stumble though, okay? So when your brother thinks it's not a right to eat meat, don't eat meat with them. Because they, they're bound. They think, no, you shouldn't eat this and you do not eat that. And he's like, hey, if that's what they think, just do it. You know, you that are free. And they have a weak faith. Stand fast, therefore, in your freedom, in your liberty, by which Christ has made us free. Listen, I'm free, 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 free. And do not be entangled with the yoke of bondage. That means, remember I told you they're tangled with the churches they were coming from, or even their own mindsets of how Christianity, how God is, the image that they have of God, so they put that on people. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you come, become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing, because that was one of the discussion points. Do these guys that are not even Jews need to be circumcised? Because they were saying they should have to be circumcised. Um, uh, I say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. Away. You who attempt to be justified by the law. He's talking to Christians. Saying you who are still trying to be like this, you're coming away from Christ. He's become a stranger to you. Jesus is. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, profits anything, but faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? What's the truth? You're free. Not free to sin. You've been set free from the bondage of being legalized and controlled. And This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of this teaching of this poisonous controlling spiritual thing that happens, it will actually poison the whole lump of the rest that are there. So be careful of it. Amen. Stand, let's, let's pray. You, some of you here or some of you watching, might still have some weeds tangled up by maybe some churches you went to. We're not attacking the church, by the way. It's, they, we're actually compassion towards them that they have been bound and therefore they poisoned and leavened the whole lump of bread and caused this lump, this leaven, this yeast to go into us. It happened to me. It might have happened to you because of some churches you were attending for a while. Maybe some preachers you were under, some people you were watching too much. This is what I want you to do before I start praying. Just ask God, Lord, if there's any leaven in me, any weeds in me, tangled himself with the good in me, with the good you've done in me. Burn it. Burn the weeds. Burn the stuff that is not of you. You say this in your heart. Close your eyes and you don't have to move your lips. Only you know and God knows. If, and if you don't know, just tell him, Lord, is there anything? Because you're talking to God. He loves you. Tell him if there's anything there that is not your truth, your way, your love, your grace. Burn it, Lord. I don't want it. Any infection that's come from the controlling spirits. 
Because if you don't deal with it, you will put this on other people too. Because it's still in you. You will treat yourself that way and you will treat others that way. So just let God check you. And I do this often still. I, I check myself. I say, God, is there anything there? Because I don't know. I have to make sure. I want you to do something else now. If anyone came into your mind, in your heart, in your memory, that was legalistic to you, that was controlling to you, treated you in that way, I want you to release them and forgive them. Okay? If you have something in your heart about them. If, they, if it came to your heart, God brought them up. And then I want you to pray for their freedom. I want you to pray that they'll have the revelation of that freedom. Amen? Because if we see, we should pray for our brothers that don't and sisters that don't. Amen? Come on. So right now, again, close your eyes. If anyone God has given you in your heart, pray for them. Amen? Now let's just pray. I'm going to pray over you. Father, we thank you for your truth. Help us, Lord God, have the right heart of honor towards those who you have, you have put in positions of officers to, to lead us. Help us truly honor them like heaven honors them. In Jesus' name. Help us have heaven culture in our honor. In Jesus Christ's name. Help us not exalt people above what you have, what, above what heaven's culture is, above what your ways are. And help us not dishonor people because now we hear messages like this and think we have to treat everyone like they're not to be honored. Help us truly live a life of honor because you love honor, God. And help us not, Lord, from today onwards, be entangled anymore with any other mindsets in our hearts that are not your heart, that are not your mindsets in Jesus Christ's name, that we will not treat ourselves or others the wrong way, that we will not try to force people and pressure them to become in, your, in our image, in our likeness, instead of yours. In Jesus Christ's name. Help us see people as gifts and treasures, Lord. And treat them that way. In Jesus' name. Amen.